So good morning, everybody. Good morning here in this room. And of course, also good morning, those who uh, participate uh, online. Mrs. Deputy Minister, uh, Director Wicher, uh, Mrs. Vogelsinger-Palm, uh, dear colleagues and uh, dear guests. My name is Ursula Münch. I'm <coughs> professor for political science and I'm uh, the director of uh, the Akademie für politische Bildung. And it's my honor and my privilege to welcome you on your last day uh, to the Akademie für politische Bildung. And of course, I uh, welcome all of those who participate digitally uh, too. I know that this is your last day of conference and some of you I already saw during the week, but I had a busy week because most of the time I thought I wouldn't be here and then most uh, uh, dates were canceled. You know this and you know the reasons why everything was canceled. So I switched be between uh, different working places uh, and therefore Beate Winter and I decided uh, to welcome you on your last day uh, here in Tutsing. And I didn't want to miss the opportunity to welcome you at least briefly today. I am very grateful to the Southeast Europe Society that we are able to jointly organize this International Academic Week once again, again this year. It's always a pleasure to have uh, this society here. I was particularly impressed by the choice of your conference theme, which I consider to be extremely important and which in my opinion is neglected in the public discussion in Germany, in Western Europe, uh, in, uh, in all of Europe. I'm a member, uh, to, to, uh, to mention this, I'm a member of the Scientific Advisory Board of MEDEM, that is the Mercado, Mercato Forum for Migration and Democracy, that's a, a German institution and Medem asks how migration impacts democratic policies, institutions, and culture, and at the same time is impacted by them. And we have learned in our sessions with Medem and by the, uh, by the publications of Medem, we have learned in recent years that the various crises that have hit Europe in recent years that uh, have been felt differently in Central and Eastern Europe on the one hand and Western Europe on the other and have also been perceived very differently. And that one, that's one of the subject, of course, of your conference, although it was a subject, and it's also a subject uh, of the publications and the research work uh, of MEDEM. These differences are also based on a very unequal collective experience of the people in the different parts uh, of Europe. In Central and Eastern Europe, you know this much better than I do, people have experienced the collapse of a political system and are much more aware of the fragility of everything political than Western Europeans. So that's also very interesting uh, split perhaps between the in the German society that the eastern part of Germany has made this experience the people there has made this experience of the fragility of every political system and the western uh, west Germans we are very glad of a quite a long period nearly uh, 73 years now uh, and so there are different perceptions all the also, uh, also in Germany for this reason too, I think it is extremely important to have this scientific exchange we had here, you had here uh, during uh, these last days. So I'm very grateful to the Southeast Europe Society that this exchange is taking place, that is taking place here in Tutsing. And we are also glad that we have here a generation of scholars who will shape the research and teaching of the future. So that's very important. It's not only important that my generation uh, talks about this, that your generation is very much involved and in, uh, that you will shape uh, the research, uh, research and teaching of the future. So therefore, I'm also very grateful that you are here. I would like to thank Mr. Christian Hagemann and Mrs. Vogelsinger Palm for preparing and organizing this conference together with Beate Winterer from the Academy. 
And, uh, you know, of course, your conference is not only remarkable with regard to its high scientific re reputation, but also with regard to its significance as a kind of network meeting for young as well as experienced scholars working on Southeast Europe issues. We are glad that you were here, that you are still here, and we hope that you enjoyed not only the conference, but also the stay here in Tutzing. At least you had a very, very wonderful week here with very good weather, much better than in the last uh, two weeks during the Oktoberfest. So uh, I think you were very lucky uh, with this too. Now I wish you a fruitful discussion. And I'm sorry, I have to apologize and ask for your understanding. I have to get right back uh, on the road to my own university where I have to moderate a panel discussion uh, at a symposium today to a totally different uh, issue, also very re remarkable and very important about security. And I ask for your understanding that unfortunately I won't be able to participate, but I want to wish you a very good last session here and have a safe trip home those who are here and those who are digitally uh, uh, with us, it's a little bit easier, but of course you never had the chance of going down to the lake. So uh, that's a, a pity for you. And I hope that you will be the next time you might be here in Tutsing as well. So thank you very much and goodbye. Yeah, uh, very good morning and a warm welcome also from my side. Um, I'm Victoria Fogelsinger Pal. Most of you have met me during these last four or five days. Um, I'm the deputy director of the Southeast Europe Association. And first of all, I have the pleasure of uh, yeah um, conveying you a very warm welcome as well from our director Christian Hagemann, who has unfortunately fallen ill, but he yeah conveys his his greetings to all of you and. Uh, He's very sorry that he cannot join us in person. He is online with us, but he's not able to speak uh, yeah, due to his uh, cough. Um, I would also like to uh, thank especially Professor Münch um, for the successful cooperation um, with our organization um, and the hospitality here at the Academy for Political Bildung, which has been um, yeah, mentioned by all of our participants throughout the week. So thank you very much for having us here and for hosting us here. Um, also, um, a big thank you to Beate Winterer and the, the team from the from the Academy for for their support and and uh, the yeah, successful cooperation. Um, I also want to thank um, the team of the Southeast Europe Association, especially Vicky Shomogi, who is not here in the room right now, but she's somewhere in the Academy, um, yeah, organizing everything. Um, and to Ivana Vukalovic, who actually organized everything um, yeah, in advance in the, in the run-up to the conference and then unfortunately fell ill as well. Um, thank you very much and also to the other people in our office that uh, pulled the strings in the back. <laughs> um, this panel discussion concludes the 60th International Academic Week. Um, of the SUG and uh, the Academy for Politische Bildung um, on the topic of return migration. Um, and in the last four days, this very knowledgeable group of researchers, both young or younger or juniors and seniors um, at very different career and educational levels has discussed and analyzed in depth a wide range of topics, very intense discussions, very interesting research projects have been presented we had topics ranging from theories and geopolitics of migration and governance, research on historical migration waves, <clears throat> different transnational modes of life, different remittances, goods, commodities that are, that are yeah, uh, crossing the borders. Uh, we talked about cultural and linguistic transfers. We watched movies on return migration. Um, we talked about motives for return migration. And above all, we address and, and analyze opportunities and challenges of return migration, both at the individual, but also at the state level. And following these intense discussions, we are now more than happy to welcome our distinguished speakers of today's panel, um, some, who, some of whom have been through the experience of return migration themselves, or who are professionally occupied with the topic of return migration. Um, so a very warm welcome to all of our speakers, both here in Tutzing and online. 
Her Excellency Ms. Lisa Gashi, the Deputy Minister of Foreign Affairs and Diaspora of the Republic of Kosovo. Welcome to you. Ms. Thank Corina. you very much for having me. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Ms. Corinna Wicher from the German Federal Office for Migration and, Ref and Refugees. And two of our conference participants, Nilay Kilinch and Samir Beharic. Thank you very much for joining us today. And now I will hand over to Ruzita Dimova, who will introduce our speakers a little bit more in detail and who will moderate the discussion. Thank you very much. <laughs> yes, so I hope you will endure this final panel, which I think is the cherry on the top because we have very interesting perspectives. And um, as long as it's been the whole week, you know, five days, it's a lot of work, but I've enjoyed it thoroughly. And uh, as a 60th, you know, event that has been organized by the Zudost Europa Gesellschaft, it's remarkable, actually. And we were told that basically this is the first time that three women have been organizing it, mm -hmm. all of them with migrant background, you know. <laughs> so <laughs> it's something unprecedented, which I think and Lumnia Yusufi is, has been in charge of this, so I want to thank her, especially. But let's go back to our panel. This is the final discussion where we want to address different aspects of the return migration, you know, in terms of personal life trajectory experience on a personal level, but also formal or let's say professional level. And we invited uh, speakers who could address these uh, issues from, as I said, multi-perspectivity or different aspects of this experience of return migration uh, that, uh, as I said, for all three of us, return migration has been probably the personal as well as professional, academic, intellectual challenge how to deal with it. And um, I hope we managed to convey that the personal and the professional and intellectual are always intertwined. It's really difficult to separate, especially for those of us who are part of these migra migratory circuits and uh, networks. So the first speaker today, I have a great pleasure to introduce Her Excellency, Ms. Lisa Gashi. Um, Lisa Gashi currently serves as Kosovo's Deputy Minister of Foreign Affairs in Diaspora. She has experience as an executive leader, innovator, and entrepreneur, leading initiatives in policy research, policy research and engagement of many stakeholders, multi-stakeholders in governance, development, migration, and diplomacy. Formerly, she established and led Germin, Kosova Diaspora.org, and UWC Kosova. Her interests include involving diaspora in improving the state of affairs in their home countries through investing, exchange of knowledge, and participating in policy making. Our second speaker is uh, Ms. Corina Viha. After having studied law in uh, Erlangen and Cork, Ireland, uh, Corina Viha worked as a research assistant at the University of Eichstätt, Ingolstadt, I hope it's correct, <laughs> for three years before starting her career at the Federal Office for Migration and Refugees in Nuremberg in September 2006. There, she was in charge of the unit for voluntary return for several years after first getting introduced to the subject in 2008. Following a two-year secondment to the German Ministry of the Interior, while being head of the Federal Office's Department for International Affairs, she is now Director General for Security, Residence Law, and Return at the Federal Office for Migration and Refugees. And our two uh, pan uh, 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 additional panelists we know from previously, we've introduced them, but I will... Um, briefly read their uh, biography again. Uh, Nilay, let me just find you in the panel where, <laughs> um, here. Nilay Kilinch, uh, great pleasure. Uh, Nilay is currently holding a postdoctoral research fellow position at the Helsinki Institute of Urban and Regional Studies. 
University of Helsinki. Her current research explored the social and professional networks of highly skilled Turkish migrants in Nordic capitals. Mila holds her PhD degree from the University of Surrey and her PhD thesis explored the second generation Turkish Germans return migration to Turkey through a lifestyle lens. Nico, uh, Nila, uh, M, Nila's MA thesis from Lund University scrutinized the gender aspect of the second generation Turkish Germans return migration to Turkey with a focus on gender and ide identity negotiations. Prior, prior to her current position, Nila held a Gerda Henkel fellowship at the Center for Advanced Studies in Sofia, Bulgaria. She was a postdoctoral fellowship supported uh, she holds postdoctoral fellowship supported by the Friedrich Ebert Stiftung at the University of Rijeka in Croatia, Pontika Mania Fellowship supported by Volkswagen Stiftung in New Europe College in Bucharest, Romania, and she was a guest postdoctoral fellow in, at the University of Leipzig in Germany. She published several articles in journals such as Ethnic and Racial Studies, Nordic Journal of Migration Research, Demographic Research, as well as book chapters about the second generation Turkish Germans return migration and transnationalism. And our fourth panelist today is um, Samir Beharic. Samir is a PhD candidate in human geography at the Department for Geographical Research on Migration and Transition at University of Bamberg. His research interests are the fields of international student migration, educational systems, and brain circulation. Recent projects include research on effects of Erasmus program on Bosnian students, intra-Western Balkan mobility schemes, and patterns in the migration of students following periods of academic mobility. Beharic received his bachelor's from the University of Sarajevo and studied abroad at universities in Berlin, Rome, and Samsun through international scholarship schemes. He earned his Erasmus Mundus joint master degree in Global Studies from the University of Vienna and Leipzig University is a scholarship hol holder of Konrad Adenauer Foundation. So um, after introducing our four panelists, I would like to give uh, the floor to Her Excellency, to Ms. Gashi, and uh, to begin by asking this question that I already mentioned about your own personal life trajectory as a returnee, because you lived abroad, you, you uh, have this firsthand experience, both personal, emotional, but now as well as professional, as someone in charge of, you know, creating policy and implementing them through your office. So, Ms. Gashi, if you could tell us some, something more about this, bridging the two experiences. Okay. Thank you so much, Rosita, for the introduction and for bringing us together. Uh, thank you so much to the organizers for putting together not just the panel, but also the theme about return migration and linking to the mobility, what it is. To my fellow panelists, I look forward to a discussion on, on a method that is very close to my heart, uh, but it's also a reality that I live on a daily basis now in the Balkans. Uh, as you introduced me, I'm uh, keen on the topic of diaspora. I think migration is a bit loaded as a topic in terms of negativities that come along with it. So I always say the best cousin of migration is diaspora. And diaspora is this fancy term that many, term that many people sort of don't associate it with negatively. Uh, but when you put the two, you could, you could combine the realities of living in between. Uh, you're right, I myself lived abroad. I spent 15 years in the Americas, predominantly in Latin America and uh, United States. Uh, my journey was uh, simply a journey of uh, a young student from the Balkans that decided to move abroad for a better education. It was also aided with a post-war Kosovo number of scholarships that were out there that allowed uh, students to, to, to go to different places to gain access to better education and as a result potentially return back. Uh, I'm, th I'm sure Samir will tell us more about you know ways of returning back and how much actually how many people don't don't uh, necessarily return back because once you're out you get exposed to all these realities um, and then you understand uh, the troubles uh, sort of on uh, living in between then sometimes it's it's a choice. So I think on this on this end, we gotta realize and portray as much as possible that migration is a choice. 
and mobility is a choice as well. We live in a world that more and more people are moving from one place to another, but we also are in, in, in a period where Europe is aging and Europe needs more talent and it needs more people, particularly when we talk about Europe uh, uh, as a continent, it needs usually people from Eastern Europe, but Eastern Europe uh, in this case, and particularly in the Balkans, if you look at the Western Balkans, uh, you say, but in order for these countries to move forward and develop, they also need their people. And so it's one of their challenges ahead of the road in terms of policy is the brain drain aspect. You see across uh, spectrums uh, in terms of uh, sectors, uh, one of the biggest asks for me with the private sector, because within Ministry of Foreign Affairs, I lead the portfolio of diaspora, but I'd also do the economic diplomacy part. And uh, one of the key uh, challenges for, for the private sector in the country is to retain talent, one, and two, to make sure that they keep their workforce to speed in terms of what are the type of skills needed. Despite the fact that there is a lot of opportunity uh, to scale, a scale sometimes is hindered due to resources that are on the ground. But then I do understand the other side of the story. And if you look Europe in general, particularly, for example, Germany, with the aging population, uh, there's a need for more labor workforce. Uh, and the labor workforce usually has to go through multi-phase uh, process of uh, getting trained, certified, skilled, and then you say, oh, wait a second, there's so much waste within the system of people being uh, constantly tested and skilled. So being a migrant, I guess, uh, you said it's a, a multi-phase concept, but beyond being a multi-phase concept, it's a concept that brings you a number of layers to identity, uh, a layer of perhaps uh, within, within the system, you might be very well educated at, uh, in a country of origin and you go to the new, your new country of residence and you have to prove yourself from zero and you have a lot of brain drain, a lot of brain waste in the process that happens. So I think when you, when you, when you look in in general, uh, for me, I'm keen to understand uh, or to to exchange a bit more about what does uh, how is this mobility aspect. Uh, where it will move. I am keen on this diaspora diplomacy end because I believe that in 20 years time, uh, even, even closer, but in 20 years time, a lot of countries will share people to people connection. I mean, with just Germany alone, Kosovo shares 450,000 um, citizens. And we're talking about citizens that are Kosovo passport holders. If you were to uh, increase that number in terms of citizens who uh, were required to remove their citizenship in order to have just one citizenship, uh, then that number will be um, larger. But what is important here is I think that people to people connection, it's family, friends, the results of networking, be it in business, be it in the sector culture, and that uh, connection of also proximity for us. Huh? Our diaspora uh, lies predominantly in Germany and Switzerland and Austria, so the DAC countries. And then uh, we have a portion in, uh, say, uh, United States and Canada. But Europe for us, it's uh, the front line in terms of if you want to move to a place, uh, that's where you go. And then uh, lately with pandemic, but also prior to pandemic, I think with, you know, when you look 2008 economical crisis, um, you've seen shift of migrants moving from one place where they've gone as a migrant to a next place. Uh, so there was a there was a tendency and predominantly uh, we've studied from ourselves looking into the uh, sort of academic diaspora, looking at folks who lived in Greece, um, uh, out of left out Albania, went to Greece, and then lived in Greece for 20 years. But then when the crisis happened, they moved to another country in Europe. So you've seen, you know, uh, so this living in between goes beyond just one location and it adds a lot to it. I think this is from my, from my uh, intro and I'm very much looking forward to, to talk about, you know, what makes people leave and what makes people come back. But I think what made me come back it's the desire to uh, help my country, one. And two, I think growing up on a conflict uh, society in terms of you know having survived the war, having been a refugee myself, having gone through the, uh, seeing my country being built, uh, seeing the state building process of it, sort of made me eager to, to reconnect and to stay connected to Kosovo, but most importantly, to want to, uh, to help Kosovo. All the, 
personal statement and those uh, applications you write about to, to universities, it's usually um, why should someone invest on your education? You always talk about returning back. So for me, it was also making sure that that investment on my journey to education is returned, but most importantly, that I add a bit of piece to the puzzle in the region because um, they say, oh, regardless of where you go, uh, home uh, rings close to the heart, but it's also, um, there are ways that we can help even without being physically present at home. Uh, it's, there's multiple ways to also do it online. So that's something to also be uh, discussed later. Thank you so much for having me once again. Thank you, Lisa. I'll follow your example and use first name to address all of you, it's better. <laughs> Uh, indeed, we've discussed the notion of home, whether it's a physical location or is it state of mind, emotional state. So it's a very complicated notion where home is and how to get there. But I want to shift gear now and uh, go get a completely different perspective now uh, with um, Corina, who uh, um, I, when we introduced each other, when we met, I, asked, I said this is a policymaker, but she corrected me. No, that's not the role that uh, Corina has. She's more of an executive of the policies. So maybe if you could clarify first of what course. the role and how it works in Germany, because it's obviously a complicated system in terms of migration, return migration policies. Yes. I hope you can hear me. Yes. Um, first of all, thank you very much for inviting me to that panel. It's really an honor to sit with you here and um, to have the possibility to discuss return. Um, and migration policies. And um, as Rosita says, yes, um, I'm uh, not a policy maker. I'm coming from an administration. Um, the Federal Office for Migration and Refugee um, is responsible for shaping um, the return programs for voluntary return. Um, as you might all know, we have a very diverse landscape regarding the, the return issue in, in Germany, um, as things are always complicated kind of in Germany. So um, we have um, this part of the, the forced return that's um, um, administrated by the federal states, um, sometimes together with the federal police. And on the other hand, we have this whole diverse landscape of uh, voluntary return. And a lot of actors and stakeholders involved in that area, the civil society, international organizations, and also administrations like my office. Um, and um, that makes it difficult on, on the one hand, because you have to bring together all the actors. Um, but on the other hand, you have all the expertise gathered uh, and um, you can try to shape the programs um, at the best for, for the returnees. Um, perhaps to, to uh, come back to, to the film session uh, yesterday, it was very impressive. And I um, thought it wonderful films, really. Um, but I was thinking in, in some way or the other, the stories that have been told have been kind of success stories, despite all the suffering, the personal suffering, the sacrifices um, involved, but uh, persons have been able to find a job, to build houses. But um, in, in my daily work, um, we see that it's not always a success story. So people um, have to go back. And um, what we are trying to do um, is to assist them in that way going back. Um, and um, I just want to give you a brief overview of what we are currently doing and um, what's very important from my side and to, to use the opportunity to be here is to come in a discussion, what can we do uh, to improve that assistance? Um, how can we profit from your uh, scientific views, your experience? Um, to really um, shape better programs. So what we are <clears throat> normally doing, um, we're looking at all the stages, what we call the, the return chain. So um, starting from still being um, in Germany and then um, finding the way um, back to, to uh, return in, in the home country. Um, 
our most recent project is um, to shape some measures um, to prepare um, persons returning um, for um, the first phase of, of the return process. Um, for example, um, we have um, some building, some, some lessons um, shaped that uh, involve business plan, uh, um, yeah, to, to shape a business plan, to develop a business plan, um, perhaps to, to uh, learn some skills um, that can be used in, in the home country um, so that uh, the persons returning have the impression they can bring something back with them, uh, a new skill, um, a, a, a new talent. Then we try to, to assist with counseling because I think counseling is a very important part of the process because only when you um, can make an informed decision um, then um, that's that's really important to to decide uh, what will will be expecting me when when I'm returning to my home country, and then of course uh, a very big part um, is the, the the financial assistance, um, the in kind assistance we can provide through our projects. We have, um, you can say, a basic project that covers uh, the, the costs of traveling um, home, the, the, the flight tickets, et cetera, um, and to, to give um, some basic financial means to, to cover the first days when you're returning. Um, but then um, we have um, also reintegration programs to um, try to assist the persons returning um, really to have a, a sustainable return, to find a job, to find accommodation, um, to build small enterprises if they want. Um, so um, that's that's the, the main focus we're having today uh, at, at the moment. And um, what brings us uh, together with the, the Western Balkans, the, the first reintegration project we have um, are indeed in, in the Western Balkans. We started 2006 uh, with uh, our project uh, Jura in um, Kosovo. And um, I think it was 2020 um, during the, the uh, pandemic, uh, we started um, our um, quite similar project in uh, Albania. And with these projects, um, we really want to adapt to the needs the returnees have. That also might include social counseling, because um, we uh, we have heard it, we have seen it's not an easy decision, it, it, and it's not an easy way sometimes um, to go back. Um, and uh, we always, uh, or we often have that connotation that um, return is a bad thing. And um, I don't think um, that's not necessarily the case because um, everybody brings something back with them. So uh, you might, I think, uh, change it also to, to um, a positive thing. So um, that's um, a short outline um, what we are doing. And I haven't prepared a, a script or something uh, because um, I think the best way is to, to exchange with you, exchange with my, my panelists and the experience. Um, I brought my head of department, Mr. Schmidtke, with me. So we will be able, hopefully, to answer every question uh, you might have for us. And um, I think that for the first. Thank you, Corinna. That was very helpful. Uh, it's indeed a very complicated system, the division of labor between different agencies and uh, structures. But now I want to give the floor to Nilay because uh, we've got to know her really well through her presentation, but also the film that um, we saw uh, two nights ago. So for you as well, Nilay, this is um, a personal as well as professional kind of, uh, you know, theme relevant to your own life, you've been all over the place, you know. And uh, as um, Lisa mentioned, uh, mobility and migration is choice. Sometimes it's choice. Sometimes it's uh, just an opportunity which we take without really considering what will follow up. I mean, 
that's my experience at least you just go for fellowship supply whatever comes you go without any consistent plan and then when you study that when you focus uh, on this topic as a primary research topic you will excavate different aspects of it so can you tell us something about this merging of the personal experience and the professional you know take on this theme yes hello everybody um yeah interesting question actually um yeah, so now I've been working on the return migration of the second generation uh, German Turkish or the Turkish German uh, migrants to Turkey for over 10 years now. And um, yeah, I interviewed more than, yeah, I interviewed 120 people in five different regions of Turkey uh, who returned for very, you know, different reasons, family driven return or, you know, for educational or career purposes. To, to find a Turkish spouse, or as in my documentary, I was showing as deportation, forced return due to uh, criminal activities. And in case they didn't hold German citizenship, then they, these people could be deported back to Turkey. For me, um, I come from a family where there is no migration really. Like I had a very stable childhood. We literally didn't move any houses. I don't have any relatives who actually uh, migrated to Germany from Turkey as Gastarbeiter. So this phenomena wasn't something that I grew up with. Uh, but one incident happened when I was 10 years old. And I mentioned you in my documentary session that I was a, a theater student and I was acting in this uh, theater which dealt with a street children so my role was a street boy so they shaved my head and I'm acting in this musical and uh, after a year in you know um, showing it in in Turkey because we were also considered government artists because this is a conservatoire we had a tour to Germany and this was the first time I would uh, go abroad without my parents and I was 10 years old I was taken to Germany and for you know, showcasing because there was this dialogue fest in uh, Berlin. We came to Berlin and first I was really shocked that there were pigeons because I always associated pigeons with Turkey and mosques because you know they're always pigeons. I was like, ah, oh, how how there are like pigeons here. Second was that I started seeing because we were staying somewhere close to Kreuzberg and at the time Kreuzberg wasn't so gentrified. So we came to Kreuzberg and it was written Kreuzberg Merkezi, like Kreuzberg Centrum, but in Turkish. Then I, I was really, and nobody told me, you know, we, we are a theater group. Nobody talks about sociological things. So nobody warned me that we are going to a place so hybrid and so bricolage. So I'm there like as a 10 year old, you know, and I'm like, I see a Döner place. I see a Turkish market and I want to ask, but nobody is interested in me. <laughs> We are, you know, theater touring. I was like so shocked. And we are staying in this hostel, you know, in the evening as we had it in here, we had free time. So then I saw like a group of kids similar my age, because in the musical, I am like the youngest one and everybody's older than, ah, there are kids there, I'm gonna go there. And then there were two Turkish kids from Germany, born and raised in Germany, only been to Turkey twice in their lives. And they were like, you are from Turkey, you're from Istanbul. Oh my God, do you have any Turkish liras with you? If you give us like 10, we'll give you hundreds of marks. We miss our homeland so much. And their Turkish was so weird. As a 10 year old, I was thinking like, what, who are these people? And I was like, why were you born in Germany? Because our parents work here. I was like, why do your parents work here? We have jobs in Turkey. You know, I understood nothing as like an urban kind of upper middle class white Turk from Istanbul. You know, I just didn't make any sense of this thing. So cut to many years later, I mean, in my documentary as well, you know, he was a street kid as well as a deported person. So I think this really affected me so much. Like, and I didn't think about it at all. Only when I started my master's. But getting back to the academic thing, uh, I think it's really important that we understand diasporas in, in relation to their specific contexts. So I think when we talk about a Turkish diaspora, which is very heterogeneous, 
we really also need to consider the temporal aspect of it, in which time frame we are talking about the diaspora and also type of migration. So for example, when we are talking about the return migration of humanitarian migrants, like refugees, I think very different, both theory and practice apply. Whereas in my research, I deal with mostly voluntary return. And what it shows, I mean, to quote Thomas Feist, who's been also working extensively on the Turkish German migration, the crucial meso level. So we usually look at the macro level and we discuss, you know, for example, all oh, the golden years of uh, Willy Brandt, the Turkish migrants were so happy in Germany, Helmut Kohl years where they were given money to, you know, go back to Turkey, the return incentive. So macro level definitely approaches and the micro level of decision making at a very individual level with families, but the crucial meso level. And what do I mean by that is cooperation of institutions. So in my research to just give you in a nutshell, the most important finding through the people's life stories was that it was either they got some sort of assistance from Germany or Turkey, but never from both. And this has been a huge problem. Whereas very few lucky ones who got it, for example, let me give you an example. In 1980s in Turkey, they started this pilot schools for the children of guest workers. So these schools in Turkey gave education both in Turkish and German. So it made it very easy for the returnee families to send their children to these schools. But then they didn't keep these schools in Turkey. It was just a period, a short trial. So then in many other interviews, coming back to Turkey as a teenager was the biggest trauma because the education system is so different than in Turkey. So it is really important that there is some sort of cooperation between countries. For example, the migration in the 1960s when guest workers were first chosen and sent to, Turkey, uh, sent to Germany, there was great cooperation between Turkey and Germany. You know, they were arranged times, everything was so organized. Turkey was also involved, the foreign ministry and the um, ministry of uh, you know, economy. And then you see that things were really different. But then after 70s, 80s, we see that the ties, be also probably because of political reasons, but when the diaspora grows you know, so big, these ties get weak. And when these ties get weak, that's when actually the problems start. So I think if I will leave you with anything, we can think of this crucial meso level um, cooperation and collaboration at institutional level of universities, of NGOs, of um, you know, um, organizations who assist. And uh, I think this is the way to, to go because we are talking about the transnational world order, but we don't have transnational citizenship. We are not there yet. Uh, we don't have transnational cooperation, so the whole burden comes on the shoulder of the individuals. And I think the idea is to get the burden a little bit, like share the burden, basically. Yeah. Thanks for this um, fruitful reflection and bringing the two aspects together. And I will ask Samir to do the same, if you can reflect on sure. your research interests, but also sure. your own personal experience. Sure. Sure. Yeah. Thank you very much for the invitation, first of all. So before anything I, I, I considered to do academically in this field, um, six or seven years ago, I became um, one of the administrators of a Facebook group called Brain Drain. Back then, I had no clue what brain drain entails. We just knew from the media, brain drains, people going. Back then, I associated it actually with young people going to study abroad. Today, this group has around 30,000 members, close to 30,000 members, 29,000 something. Uh, and it brings together young people from the Western Balkan region. We share in the group, um, we share opportunities for young people to study abroad, to do traineeships, internships. And of course, we promote them to come back. So we promote actually brain circulation, but this is what I realized six years later. Um, back then, um, we had young people, and even today, actually, applying for scholarships, you know, to study abroad as Erasmus. So someone will come there and ask, hey, guys, I'm a second year psychology student. I would like to study in Germany for a semester, for Erasmus, in Turkey, wherever. Um, and they will ask 
could you give me some tips and tricks how to write my motivation letter to 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 tips and tricks to write a good cv resume and so on so someone from the group would say yes i went there through this program just send me your cv i will send you a feedback so this worked out marvelously so we had there hundreds of students an excellent research pool actually this is also what i realized later um uh, of those people who are actually um have international experience inclination to migrate to study abroad to come back um, and we had since then um, realized okay we have a, a, a pool of people who have been studying abroad several years later today we have those people applying for jobs and this is now an interesting shift to see where do those people who six years ago you know applied to go for an exchange at university of Wroclaw in Poland you know, what do they and where do they want to work today? Many of them actually want to go again abroad. When we talk to them and we ask them, why do you want to go abroad again? You know, they, they, don't, they don't quote, um, you know, lack of jobs. They don't quote, they don't say, um, I, I couldn't find the job. Um, the, the, the salary is not right here in Bosnia or in the region, because those are young people, highly educated. A lot of them then continue doing their masters abroad because, you know, one follows the other. They say they don't see the perspective in, in to, to stay in the country or in the region for that, for that matter. So we here don't speak anymore about youth unemployment rate, which is in any case high across uh, across the region. We don't speak, you know, about not being able to provide for uh, for their families. We actually speak um, about the future for them and their children and values. And I think the values is something that gets under our radar when we speak about young people who don't want to, you know, who have lived abroad, lived based on the, you know, some, I would I wouldn't even call them Western values. I would call them universal values which are not respected and upheld back, back in the region. And also very strong motive of people either upon their return that they also want to go back or even that they don't even want to return is that they see how their fellow you know, peers from international universities, again, are being treated when they return back home. They are being treated as a, as a, as a competition. They are being treated as seen as a threat you know, especially by those well-connected circles um, from some fishy private universities that are mushrooming, at least in Bosnia and Herzegovina and throughout the region. So I tend to say, you know, in Bosnia and Herzegovina, especially, um, instead, you know, in government having officials and alumni clubs from Harvard, Yale, Oxford, Cambridge, we have, you know, alumni clubs from the University of Kachuni which is, you know, a small village in Bosnia that also has a runs a university in the middle of forests, you know, um, which was open for public op officials to buy, to buy, you know, diplomas and get promoted in their, in their work. And actually that's true, you know, that we have like those people who are well-connected, bought their diplomas. And every time when they see someone from University of Kent, you know, with their PhD coming back to, to, to Bosnia, and actually I know many stories like that, you know, they see them as disruptors of the status quo. And someone currently studying for abroad, you know, will say, why the hell should I return if I see my friend Yasmin, you know, not being able to get a job, despite the fact he has a double major in, in you know, master's, double, you know, PhD, joint PhD, speaks five languages, you know, and then people will say, that's a red flag for me. I won't even, I won't even return. I'm speaking about Bosnia. In Kosovo, in Albania, uh, I can observe a bit different, you know, uh, different situation. Um, every time when I would see, you know, or, or hear um, 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 a Kosovo official or Albanian official, you know, you can hear at least from the accent, which is also the case with with uh, Miss, Miss, Miss Gashi, even though I, I, I researched in depth about um, her CV, knowing what is behind. In a lot of cases, when it comes to Bosnian officials, I'm ashamed when they start when they start speaking in English, even if they even if they know English. Um, fast forward to six or seven years later. Um, I'm doing this PhD and I also had my own experience, you know, um, of, of, of studying abroad. And uh, when I applied with my resume, my, my academic supervisor, Professor Kula, he, he told me, oh, Samit, like you're researching yourself, actually, you know, this brain circulation. And there is always this question, do you, need, do you intend to return? From Bosnia and Herzegovina, you know, they consider leaving a, a, a bad thing. I actually consider brain drain excellent thing, provided that the country offers you know, incentives for people to return. 
Because if they return, they will return with new knowledge, with skills, and very important with new contacts. Because it's the contacts in their host countries that can, you know, propel their own countries um, forward. Um, which, in case of Bosnia and Herzegovina, hasn't been hasn't been so um, 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 noticeable. Um, just a couple of just a couple of days ago, um, I spoke with one of the foreign officials who visited a um, small community, uh, the town of Yaitse, which is my hometown in central Bosnia. He went to a school, a uh, high school. Um, uh, the topic was something else. It was segregated, ethnically segregated education. He went to a school to talk to students, 14, 15 year olds, about segregated education. He asked them about their plans. There was about 20 students. They're like 15, 16 years old. He asked them, uh, what do you plan to do you know, after you finish your high school or your studies? Do you plan to stay? He asked them, please, those who would like to stay, could you raise a hand? <laughs> no one raised a hand. And this is actually something sinister. And this is what we heard also last night during the movie, when young people who are 11, 12, or 15 plan to leave. And they don't plan to leave in order to return, you know, like to, you know, to help their country because they're sick and tired, you know, of, of, of having, you know, the country and the system treating them not fairly. And a lot of people leaving the region today are leaving the region bitter, with bitterness in their mouth. And this is something, you know, that doesn't leave you with some kind of a high motivation to return and even to help your country because they left because the, their country didn't not help them or offer them anything, but their country did just offer them, you know, equal opportunities to compete against those from the University of Kachuuni, you know? Uh, so in that sense, I would say that um, discussing re-migration and discussing, you know, brain drain, brain gain, um, uh, potentials and studying abroad, um, it's also about values. It's also about, of course, policies, but we can get, you know, good quality policies without quality data, which we don't have. And I will, I will, I will um, conclude by just saying, um, yesterday I mentioned we are part of the Western Balkans Alumni Association, and we just uh, concluded with our tracer study. That is a quite unique uh, study, regional study, where um, uh, we have done a research um, on mapping um, Western Balkan students from the Western Balkan Six, uh, mapping them where they are currently, those who have took part in Erasmus Plus exchange schemes and Erasmus Plus uh, funded uh, study abroad programs um, throughout the past, you know, um, and 18 years, if I'm not wrong. Um, we are trying to not just to map them where they are now, but also to try to find out about their inclination either to return or to stay and the reasons um, thereof. And soon we will, we will publish it and I will be very um, happy to um, share it with you, which will again, you know, disclose, you know, uh, publish and um, some of the motivations for young people, um, both um, to stay in their country, to leave the country and also to return in case uh, they, would, they would like to, to return. And I would, I would stop here, I think. Change things. Great. Yes, so um, uh, a real game changer, you know, you and your pals, really congratulations on this initiative. It's something that is very much needed. I would um, give the audience the floor as well, possibility to ask questions, but just before that, a um, uh, summary that I think addresses both Lisa's and um, Corina's kind of positionalities in terms of this fatalism, this mistrust in the country, you know, the, I'm from North Macedonia, and the same goes as what the summer said, people are just so resentful towards going back because they don't believe in the institutional framework, corruption, you know, networks, you need to lobby. So my question to you, Lisa, is how do you combat this? This is so difficult to change because it's not just the actual state of affairs. This is a very, how to say, uh, almost phantasmic dimension in, in which young people just uh, refuse to participate, you know, they just refuse to um, consider going back or staying, flight or leaving is the best solution. So my question to you is how do you, you know, um, the, what kind of strategies and tactics do you develop in order to redefine and change this per perception or this 
position of Kosovo or the Western Balkan countries where everything is considered to be failing, bad, you know, dysfunctional and uh, uh, not stimulating young people. And just uh, uh, an addendum, uh, I think this kind of image is perpetuated and created by how the West, the Western countries in a way are present in the Balkans. There is a very hierarchical neo-colonial position in which the West comes to teach the Western Balkan countries how to change, how to improve. There is this whole industry of consultancies, you know, foundations that try to learn the best potential. We are all witnesses of how many medical personnel and stuff is flying because there is possibilities to come to Germany or to the Netherlands. And, um, you know, there is almost shamelessness on the side of the West, how they recruit and take all this valuable stuff. We saw during the Corona that there is a really lack of medical personnel. Mm -hmm. So my question is then how to, uh, you know, uh, consider these two aspects, the local context, which is very valid, but also this top-down context, the West trying to perpetuate and produce the image of the Western Balkan as a corrupt, you know, dysfunctional place. Mm -hmm. So I just wanted to... Sure, I think we have a fair share of challenges ahead of us as a region. Uh, we have not, we should not be shying away from pointing out things that do not work. Uh, I've come to this, to join this position. So I, my background is, is on civil society and not just me, a multiple... Uh, appointed this year on the new government that has come on an agenda to uh, basically do two things is jobs and justice is our mantra and uh, the, the 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 fight that we are in 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 a sense of the reforming of the institution connects to the backlog of what has happened in in a period of time with bad governance with uh, problems those are present across the spectrum be it in kosovo or uh, other places so in order for i'm a firm believer that in order to improve we have to be able to face our own reality but when you face the reality, I think there's a lot that gets said about us really without much evidence behind it. Huh? Uh, I'm a big uh, supporter of partnerships, but I'm also a big complainer of the partnership, particularly when we talk about coming in on a development aid to support our countries and yet uh, using the development aid to basically take the talent out of our country. So in that question, I say to my partners, sorry, you might need 100 doctors from Kosovo, but what are you giving Kosovo back? Well, we're training, we give them access, they come to improve, they live in Germany. And I say, but what does that make you feel like that they want? Uh, and what uh, to, to get a doctor out of Kosovo, you might think that was not a big investment, but it takes a big investment. If you if you were to calculate it for a family in Kosovo to raise the first chi first child is seventy five thousand euros in total. When you put when you couple all the services that get provided, and you might say, well, that's not a lot. That's not a big. We can pay for it. No, because uh, it's it's impossible in in terms of the schemes that you, that you provide. So first, it's looking into that, and I'm uh, I'm okay if you take a hundred doctors. Are you giving me back a hundred di diaspora scholars that come back to to do work? Because it's supposed to be a win-win, and that's why uh, I'm often uh, and complaining about the triple win uh, idea. And within within triple win, people say, oh, the country of origin benefits um, as much as the country of uh, residence. And I say, no, that's not true. Uh, it's not it's not equal and there's a lot within triple win that has not no eth ethical values within it huh? um, let's not talk about recruitment process let's not talk about a dehumanizing process of visas let's not talk about multiple other aspects that go into it but then you 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 know the the reason this works still is because people have uh, the needs and the migration Patterns cannot change with the policy of a year or two or five. It takes time. So whatever has not been done in 20 years cannot be addressed within a year or two. But at the same time, uh, to go to Sami's point, I'm fine with people leaving as well. Because if people did not leave in the 70s and 80s, uh, I perhaps wouldn't be here. It's precisely the Kosovo people that were abroad that ring the alarm bell of what was happening in Kosovo. So in a way, through our diaspora community, we got a voice at all foreign chancelleries, 
to talk about what was happening on the ground. If it wasn't for Kosovo diaspora people protesting in DC, New York, in Berlin, in other places, I might have not been alive today. So in a way, it's people who have lived abroad that were our ambassadors. So we had embassies before we had actually real embassies abroad. So in that aspect, that's one. Two, Kosovo is where it is today, because also the people abroad has maintained uh, a structure. Let's say in the 90s, they supported the parallel education system. They give 3% of their income to support this parallel edu education system. While we, my, my parents and cousins and other people have studied in, 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 in very poor conditions, uh, we speak Albanian today because diaspora communities helped us in a way. So these people, uh, aside from uh, trying to integrate themselves, be it in Germany and Austria and Switzerland, uh, making sure they meet the basic standard of what it means to be a migrant worker, uh, being striped out of identity to claim that they are not Kosovars, they are Italians per se. Uh, they've gone through all this process, yet they get the willingness, the courage and the resiliency to still uh, build a, a connection and continue to help families. Sometimes I uh, met a lot of diaspora members that you know, might not uh, have the luxury to send their kids to extra activities because for the extra activities, there is a money in place and that money is usually sent back home. So we talk a lot about sending remittances, so which it's one part of the puzzle. There's a lot of social remittances that come with diaspora communities. And particularly for the Balkans, I believe that diaspora is a solution in the long term because uh, they bring not just um, you know the financial resources. Those um, you know we do, it's it's not that the Balkans lack financial resources. Let's be honest, we lack um, certain 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 rules within the place, which goes back to the values that Samir was mentioning, and I believe uh, transparency, accountability. Uh, those uh, those um, those communities that live abroad. If you if you if you are in Germany and you respect the rules, you come back to Kosovo. You gotta respect the rules. But it's it's in this way that it's also social remittances that get often undermined uh, in the process that are very powerful, I believe, for our region. But beyond it, I think if I were to go to project after project, my com my my usually my skepticism about a project is that. Often the Balkans have turned into a laboratory of big donors. Uh, there have been test and trial process and pilots. And unfortunately, these, these pilots and projects are three, three year projects. And you really can't do an empirical trade studies for a long time to understand what it means to leave as, uh, as, a, as, a, as a student without really having an expectation to stay anywhere. You go, I left myself, I went to high school in Costa Rica. And you would say, what does a 15 year old from Kosovo has to do with Costa Rica. When I went to Costa Rica, Costa Rica, uh, Kosovo was not even a country. Uh, Costa Rica, all I knew about it was from telenovelas, huh? uh, because in the Balkans, telenovelas, uh, whether be it Latin or telenovelas or Turkish soap operas are very famous. Um, and all I knew was Antonio uh, Casate Conmigo, for example, in Spanish. I had very little. Then I moved to Argentina. And in Argentina, they have this cultural expression when they want to say, my house is a mess or the traffic is a mess. They say, ay, que Kosovo. And I was surprised and shocked. I was like, but wait a second. Why do you use the term Kosovo to, to explain mess? They said, well, in the 90s, you were the front line of all the media, Kosovo Quilombo, like uh, basically during the war, explaining, explaining what was happening. And then after that, we heard very little about you. And then for a moment, I paused, but then I realized that even within Kosovo, we often refer to Africa, we refer to Bangladesh as what we don't want to follow, huh? in a sense like, oh, it's, uh, the traffic is Bangladesh. Uh, which when you, when you use it from this end, uh, and then when I compared it, it makes sense. Argentina think we are a mess. We think Bangladesh is a mess. It's always someone else's fault and someone else's problem. So in this aspect, I think exposure is key because just me being there it might not make a big impact, but the fact that I got to know uh, the other and be able to walk through the processes of what it means to be, uh, you know, from uh, from the Balkans, because I think also we we get labeled on multiple ends. Those are just those are just assumptions and perception, which I think uh, they get drawn by narrative. And the narrative back in uh, you know back in the 70s and 80s, you you look at the Balkans as gas gas spiders. That was the program, and then often and then you move on. You look at the Balkans. I mean, look at Berlin today. Um, when the Italian left the gastronomy sector in Berlin, the Albanians took it over in the 80s. But they're still Italian restaurants. They're not Albanian restaurants. 
because the branding is Italian, but the workers are Albanian. And partly I often, when I meet, uh, you know, the business folks, I say, but why don't you label Albanian? Why don't you add in the menu Albanian dishes or something? They say, well, some of them are Albanian dishes, but it just, uh, they were Italian restaurants. They kept the label, they kept uh, the work and it's, there's not much known about Albanian cuisine there, right? And so it takes time to build a brand. So often you fall for a brand that is much more powerful, despite the fact that uh, what is behind is, is Albanian. So I'm, I'm saying all this uh, because I think there is certainly, there's a lot of complexity to it, but I think what we need is a bit of more brain circulation. I think there's, there's a need to have a much more um, twinning between universities. There's a need to have much more exchange uh, in terms of cities. There's a need to build this city, city to city uh, approach, but also citizen to citizen. For example, uh, within our government, we have three ministers that come from diaspora. We're not just saying that we want to engage diaspora, we want to bring the talent back. We are actually building a framework. So my minister lived 30 years in Germany, Ms. Tonika Gervala Schweiz, and has come back. Her family lives in Bonn. She lives in Pristina at the time being, despite the fact that she's, deputy, uh, she's a deputy prime minister, minister of foreign affairs. Um, doesn't, uh, you know, it, it, it didn't, it didn't, take her a long time to just fall back into, into the cost of a reality. But at the same time, what my minister brings is a, a set of values that are quite different from, from the norm on the ground. And I think that's beautiful, but also a challenge, a challenge for the administration here to understand that uh, if someone comes out from outside, it's not here to take your job. It's not here to threaten you. But often the biggest challenge for us to implement the policies of engaging diaspora within institution is um, current staff are feeling threatened because they say, okay, somebody with extra skills is coming in and they will be better at their job. But here we need to build a bit more trust on a, on a local end and we need to build a bit more patience on the diaspora end and build programs of co-creation. Actually, just next week, I'm welcoming the first cohort of citizen diplomacy fellows, which are diaspora members living abroad. They're coming back on a paid fellowship position at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. This is a pilot program we, we built. And what I was uh, the most uh, sort of uh, sort of surprised for good was the number of applicants. I mean, in a, in a period of three weeks, we received close to 200 applications from 28 countries of brilliant minds from across the world that were willing to quit their current position, come in on a six paid fellowship program with one and only reason you will hear people, they said, well, my family predominantly, most of them were young, where people were first generation and second generation born and raised abroad. And they would say, but what is it that you want, want to do with Kosovo? And they said, look, we come there every, every summer, but all we know is cousins. So the connection has been so familiar with uh, just family members, but we don't know Kosovo beyond family ties. And so for me, it was very interesting to hear this perspective, but also to hear them saying, I'd like to know Kosovo from a professional scene without having uh, the voice of my parents talking about, you know, how much struggles survive, uh, you know, the, 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 all, the, all the background of the family, because they say every summer we come, we really enjoy here. We enjoy not just going out for parties, we enjoy having fun with, 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 uh, people our age. And so they, they, they find something very meaningful. And I think for us, we'll be plugging in models of this type to make sure that we include. And then in addition to the citizen diplomacy fellows that we are implementing as a Ministry of Foreign Affairs, we had a health sector who in the past, it used to take you five years to get licensed, to get the papers, to get the testing, to simply exercise uh, your, your job in Kosovo. And now we've just basically, um, to remove the, the, the bureaucracy that comes in a way and have built a, a program where you could also do a telemedicine within Kosovo. So it will, it will take time, but this goes along with uh, a lot of uh, problems on the ground. Certainly unemployment, inflation prices right now, it's not just Kosovo that is, is, is paying for the, for the price of, of um, democracy of our standing with, with Ukraine. It's, uh, there's a lot that gets into it. Energy crises that are going to be very tough. I mean, this winter is going to be very dark. So it's 
completely understandable for people to not be happy. Uh, but also we are in a post pandemic time. Uh, and then with with the uh, unjust uh, invasion of Ukraine, you have all this bad narrative and media propaganda that goes on across the spectrum. There is always a story about uh, something bad, but there's never a story about success, at least in our media narratives. Uh, I've, I've, I've known a lot of businesses in Kosovo that got the capital from diaspora family to, to start it. I know a lot of diaspora entrepreneurs have come back, started their business. I mean, if you look, Girafa, for example, is this platform in Kosovo and in the region now. It's a search engine, ultimately. The guy I came back from New York, started building a team with five, 10, now he has 300 employers. So you don't hear this a lot because obviously it's a, it's a tendency to focus on, on uh, the negatives. And I'm not saying the negatives are not present uh, by any means. I think we have to, we have to be uh, open and, uh, and, and uh, transparent about what needs to improve because if we lie to ourselves, we cannot move. And my last remark on this, and it's in terms of what do you do? I feel like often countries are so focused on trying to find a solution and very often they forget that this is a non-competitive business. Uh, diaspora engagement, uh, a return migration. It's not, it's the way people settle in Kosovo does not mean that the same way they settle in Ireland. But if there are frameworks on how you tackle, let's say, uh, Kosovars in, in Germany and how you tackle Bosniaks in Germany, there are some similarities. So I'm a big fan um, of an organization called CASE, where you copy and steal everything that works. And there's <laughs> multiple best practices out there that could, could work for you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I opened the floor for people from the audience, but just before we move to that, I want to ask uh, Corina, I'm aware that you represent an official federal you know, office, but I just wanted to hear your reflection on this perpetuation and this kind of fulfilling prophecy of negativity about the Western Balkan countries and these donor programs that don't work and the EU accession process, which is so blocked and so unrealistic and the visa regime for people from Kosovo, you know. So I'm just uh, thinking that this is all intertwined. You cannot put the blame on the Western Balkan countries, so, although, as Lisa said, we do carry responsibility. So how would you, you know, see the implication of the West and Germany, especially in this process of neg negative production? Very difficult question, I have to admit. Um, I think uh, what Elisa Gashi says, um, what's, what's really important is to, to talk with each other as equal partners. Um, and um, that um, is also necessary in my point of view when we are talking about visa regime, um, when we are talking about triple win, um, I always have the impression that um, of course, uh, when, when Germany um, is um, changing legislation, et cetera, of course um, they have a certain interest in, in mind and uh, I think sometimes um, they neglect a little bit the consequences um, that that has or the impact um, that that means for for the Western Balkans or other partner countries uh, I think it's um, it's not a phenomenon uh, really um, special for the Western Balkans I think we have that in in uh, a lot of areas and a, a lot of so-called um, partnerships. So um, what's what's very important and also for for someone who is working in administration um, is to to really talk with each other. And um, what was surprising for me um, was the uh, what what you said, Samir, um, that uh, persons returning um, are. Yeah, seen as a threat uh, in, in the, the local community. And I think that's, um, for example, a point that's not really known or well known uh, in, in, in Germany for persons uh, shaping programs, shaping partnerships, etc. cetera. Um, so, um, and I think that's important to know to, to really address that, that topic and that issue from, from our point of view and from, from the, the, the clients we normally deal is, 
it's quite the opposite. We think uh, they need assistance because uh, they will have difficulties to to cope uh, in in um, in their home country. So um, <clears throat> yeah, um, as you said, and I cannot say something to 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 uh, the EU uh, citizens. I'm I'm sorry. Uh, I would promote it if that would be in 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 my possibilities, but unfortunately not. Um, but um, what we um, on an administrative level um, can do is really um, to promote um, the 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 equal partnership idea and the exchange, really. Um, so. Um, and that's what we're trying to do um, in 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 our office, and to to kind of counsel um, our politicians or uh, our ministries with the experience we are making, and say that's the experience we are making, that's the information we are getting. Sometimes, <laughs> yeah, that's um, I see the case, yeah, that, but that's uh, the the reality we have to face. But uh, nevertheless, um, we still have to talk and promote, and to keep on talking and promoting, and uh, to try that someone's listening. And I think as long as you you keep on going. Um, you will reach something at some end. It takes time. I, I see that. And it's. Um, I think we could speed it up, of course. Um, but um, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Any questions from the audience? Comments? Lumnia? Thank you, Rosita. My name is Lumnia Yusufi, and I'm one of the organizers. <laughs> and for Mrs. Gashi, I'm albanologist, and I work a lot uh, also with Kosovo, but not only. And I had a special um, question for her, because Mrs. Gashi, you had the example with <laughs> the minister, um, Gervala, um, Gervala Schwartz. Um, what do you think about the acceptance in Kosovo with returnees? I don't see it. Uh, we hear it a lot here because we know this discourse changing with your government and the party, uh, the Dendosia, we know it, that they put the focus on diaspora. And because of that, maybe you are in this position, <laughs> not only of course, but I would say that in the government be before it would be not really <laughs> possible, but I follow a little bit because I have a project in Berlin with uh, cultural transfer with the migration in Kosovo and Northern Macedonia. And I follow the newspaper uh, in Kosovo very intensive way. And I've never, really never read um, so much critique about a politician like for Mrs. Gervala Schwartz. And I don't think that the Kosovo newspaper became so critical. It would be good, but it, it isn't. I would suppose that is because of her migration background. I would say it is because she's a very strong woman. Uh, and uh, also there's a multiple uh, parts. So Dumia, thank you so much, not just for bringing this question forward, but for everything you do. Although we haven't met, uh, we do know each other from far. So that's the beauty of also technology, but also following on uh, what um, folks are doing in, in the metro of be it diaspora engagement, be it understanding the migrant roots, be it looking into the perspective of how do we bring communities together. Uh, you're right. I'm very happy, but I'm also very skeptic. But most importantly, I'm happy that we have a media scene that is very open and, and free, and they can complain and they can talk about it a, a lot. But I think what I'm, uh, what I'm a bit sad is that there's a lot of personalized politics that go into media scene. You wouldn't call those investigative articles. You wouldn't call those... Uh, 
uh, sort of uh, um, article of opposition in a way, but they're very personalized. There are a lot of uh, attacking and it's completely normal. Uh, Ms. Gervala does not just come from Germany in terms of the migrant background. She is a staunch political activist that has been there since day one, uh, prior to Kosovo War, during the Kosovo War, throughout the Kosovo liberation, a commitment, uh, Kosovo's independence. And she's been also an active member of LDK party. And now she's brought forward a new party, uh, which uh, is labeled Guzo. Uh, so it's, it's, it's completely uh, present. And I often, uh, I guess it's, it, it, it depends. Uh, I often look into the narratives. There's a lot, uh, the narrative is stronger towards women politician who dare uh, to have stand and who are very uh, clear in terms of public. I think what Ms. Gavala also bring, it's a different attitude towards work. Um, I think uh, she's one of those uh, individuals that shies a bit away from the PR herself, so that not a lot of promotion of self-promotion in the in, in the process, but very much into uh, leading processes and moving moving things forward. In terms of the challenge to integrate um, the migrants, or in terms of engaging diaspora, it is clear there is a pushback from. Um, Certain part, and I see it certainly in my ministry. Uh, when we when we launched the program for citizen diplomacy fellowship, I've heard you know uh, and folks here saying, but we're paying a bit too much. Maybe it's not worth it. Why are we giving them such a big priority? We should be working on internal resources. And I say. Well, uh, because uh, sometimes it's 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 not uh, it's not a lot of investment if you bring someone that just uh, uh, either state the obvious uh, or brings uh, brings additional uh, knowledge to the table, uh, and I feel like that is not just the contribution to give back to Kosovo, but it also contributes on an internal institutional brain circulation. We got to be out there. Unfortunately, with the visa liberalization, the Kosovars have been discriminated for way too long. Uh, and I am very hopeful that this uh, discrimination and this not delivery of the European Union will stop. Uh, in this October, I'm very hopeful about it, but uh, won't confirm anything because certainly we have been waiting for it for way too long. Kosovo is the only country that has fulfilled 95 criteria, technical one, including a, a political criteria of a demarcation process, and yet uh, it's uh, it has been isolated. And often I joke with my counterparts, I say, "Come on, we are 1.7 million. What difference would it make?" Even if we chose one day to wake up and leave completely Kosovo, what would what difference would it make in the European market? I don't know if you're familiar of this this movie called uh, in California called One Day Without Mexicans, uh, because there's a lot of uh, assumption that uh, you know migrants are taking your job, that migrants uh, are being positively discriminated in, in, with some of certain policies. And then there's this movie that when uh, when the Californians wake up, uh, the, the Mexicans have left. So there was no gas, there was no supermarkets, there was no fast food chain, uh, and it, it 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 depicts a reason. Uh, it depicts also reality of you know the type of job that a big portion of migrant fulfills in order to to move forward. And there's the stories of people working from McDonald's and by becoming the CEO of their company, but the trajectory of that person to move ahead it's completely different from you know a regular uh, person that is born and raised in US and it's white and it's uh, um, you know a heritage so here is there's a different part but I think even within within our clear message but also our clear resources put into engaging diaspora uh, I said you see this at the government level you see it at a cabinet level we have a lot of advisors that have left Berlin had left DC had left London to come in to help uh, and this could be easily seen, but we are also being seen as often. Um, actually, uh, some of uh, some of the opposition called us uh, calls us junior because we are also not acquainted so much with institutional practices that have been going on. So it's the way people interpret law uh, and the practice. They say, "But this is by practice," and I say, "But this is this is could be by practice, but it's not by law because law says something else. The practice that you've created is something else." But they say, "But it's okay. There's been always." And I said, no, it's not okay. There's no such a thing as okay if things are not uh, unlawful. And so I think in that aspect, um, our approach is also 
Uh, we are be beyond being a politician in position. We all have uh, our professional life. So today I'm here serving as a deputy minister of foreign affairs for a period of time. But if I leave, I could go back to my research, right? So it's not like the, it's not my one and only identity layer. Like Samir was talking about, you know, this mushroom universities that have produced diplomas and have made people feel like they are capable of doing a job. Um, it's unfortunate, it's, it's, it's a practice that has been present in the region where people have the degree, have sort of the, the, the background, but that doesn't mean that uh, that's legit, right, in, in, in the process. And it's unfortunate because when that is the case, then um, it's, it's very hard to push, to push policy. And we've seen it with, with the reform of public administration. Um, you know, we have more people in public administration that Kosovo needs in terms of delivery. During pandemic time, um, you know, our institutions could function with 20 people. So to say then if they can function with 20 people, what does the 500 others that are currently off work doing, right? Or working remotely, but barely people work remotely because it's not that they had the capacities to have a laptop at home. Right, and so the institutions still function. And I think here is the, the the question that goes in with with return migrant, and I do also have uh, uh, have a have a bit of of objection to to the way sometimes migrants get returned. I think to Miss uh, Richer, it's. Um, there's this tendency uh, to, and it's understandable from the German side, to keep the, the high tech ones and the ones that have skills and to return the ones that you can't use, right? In the process. And I think that's where uh, we have to figure out the system, either be it, you know, I, I, I know that uh, returns come also with a lot of uh, sort of assistance, be it opening their own shop, but from the projects that I've followed uh, from far and not so close, but far, uh, there was a perception that um, I've heard among the returnees saying that, look, they will still look for the way to go out because they are determined to make it somewhere else. And so I think in, in that aspect, uh, certainly uh, there is some rooms to perhaps uh, co-create different, different, different ways. Although nowadays, I mean, for us, the peak of, of migration, illegal migration, I would say was in the 2015. Uh, and that was a time where it's also um, not just for Kosovo that that route that open uh, Ill illegal migration brings a lot of um, challenges to the migrant, but also it could, it could put their, their life into danger in the process. And so here uh, to, to move forward for better, we did have, for example, projects that actually GIZ uh, with German uh, foreign ministry, uh, German BMZ supported where they have educated uh, the citizens about um, you know, uh, the, the, the challenges that one goes through illegal migration. So at, at, at today's uh, time, we have improved the process and I would say uh, sort of legal and labor uh, migration are the two major things, which I think it's great, but I also think there's a lot of debate on a long-term uh, long term path in terms of implications that it would have in, in, in the Western Balkan. Because, Thank you, Lisa. Uh, uh, we're officially over with the slot. Can we have five, ten minutes more for questions? Yeah, for sure. Respond maybe to the comments about yes. uh, keeping the best skilled workers while sending back those who are. Yeah. Um, the problem with that issue is, um, of course, the 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 the, the skilled labors. Um, the our legislation they allow uh, them to stay legally in Germany. We have a lot of possibilities for legal migration, and um, on on the other hand, we have um, a, a lot of persons applying for asylum. For uh, for example. Um, who, who cannot fulfill um, the, the requirements um, for a, a, a legal residence permit. So, um, of course, that means um, that these persons are not allowed to stay in Germany and have to return uh, to, to um, their, their home country. So, of course, that causes the impression we, we keep the, the skilled ones and uh, bring back uh, the, the others. Um, but um, what we are trying to do um, is um, to at least um, 
take what they what what they learned what they experienced in in Germany and to um, assist them in making something out of that so um, as difficult as that might be we we see that also and um, I totally agree um, what you said regarding um, these um, skilled labor migration or legal labor migration in, in general. Um, of course, that's a, a, a huge uh, issue in, in, in Europe as a whole, because uh, we, we need the, the, the skilled workers. Um, but of course, we have to think about what that means for um, the sending countries, um, of course. Um, and I know there's a, a big debate about uh, that issues also with a, with a, a lot of person knowing, uh, especially was Western Balkans very well. And um, some of them said we have to skip these um, legal migration rules that offer every person um, uh, the entitlement for applying for a visa. Um, because that would mean a brain drain and um, we um, are not doing um, the sending countries a favor. Um, and um, I think that's that's really a big issue we have to debate about. On the other hand, um, I say um, when the, the personal situation um, of the people uh, implies they have to go, they want to go, um, then why shouldn't we give them the possibility to go on the other hand? So um, I think uh, it's, it's a very difficult issue to decide for, for an administration, for, for a politician, because you decide about uh, the, the destiny of, of the person. Any other question? Yes, Yuri? Thank you very much. Uh, my question will be to uh, Ms. Viher, uh, since she has also like a legal background. I think that uh, it could be best answered by her as well, and also as uh, implementing the policies uh, in one case, because we spoke uh, regarding the cases in Western Balkans in the last days, especially Albania, and there are a lot of people who have individual feuds like uh, I mean, there is a definitely danger for life for the person in case if the person is asking asylum seeker status in Germany. And uh, mostly there is this uh, regional uh, like policy that differs from federal state to another one. And uh, what happens if this person is being denied asylum seeker status and is being sent to his country of origin? Because I know that legally in terms of uh, the Convention for the Protection of the Refugees is uh, having in the preamble this very brief phrase saying that part the focus is on the life on, of the individual, but when you see the implementation of the states, usually they make this general definition of the countries under active conflict. Mm -hmm. So what is uh, the legal obligation for that if you return the person who really has this La, uh, danger for his life and is really under threat of being killed by the other hostile like you know who is keeping this type of uh, cases thank you just a, a follow up because we had uh, uh, representatives from the bureau for Ruk Her Hil Hilfen. they told us that 99 percent of the all up asylum application from albania are unblocked denied even if there is case of domestic violence homophobia blood feud real reasons they're unblocked denied mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> yeah um i, I try to, to 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 answer the question um of course um every case uh, you're dealing in in the asylum procedure is an individual case so um the 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 question is um we have on the one hand, uh, the um, country of or um, country of origin information. We have the legal framework, but uh, we also have, of course, the individual story of the the persons applying for um, asylum. And um, I know that there are um, a lot of cases 
um, dealing with the issues you you mentioned. Um, so um, what they have to do in in their um, asylum procedure is to really um, kind of prove um, to say, look, when we're going home, then we are facing uh, really um, death threatening circumstances. Um, and um, it's also one legal rule that uh, when a person faces uh, death in uh, when you return them, then normally um, you cannot return them. That's uh, the, the legal framework. But you have to prove that in a certain way. So, um, of course, I don't know the, the individual circumstances uh, and the individual cases, but uh, that's how the asylum procedure normally should go. So there shouldn't be a return if there is really uh, an issue back in, in uh, the home country. Not every issue, of course, um, but uh, it really has um, to have some implications on, on the person when returning. More, uh, hello, Azerbaijan here from Bosnia Herzegovina. Um, this is going to be more so a comment and a rhetorical question than a direct question. But um, I often get jealous looking at the Kosovo government and seeing all of these amazing people um, with a great, great background, academical background, but also as well professional background. And then we have this friend that we also mentioned yesterday, and Samir mentioned him to today, who has a double PhD and has worked as an advisor at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. And due to that, he like his health deteriorated literally, and he left the job and got the another job, but because he couldn't help handle it, just it was impossible for him to endure it anymore. And he went there with open mind and open heart uh, wanting to to create better op opportunities for young people who who would come after him but also to present our uh, country in the best possible way of course um also what i really admire with the Kosovo because i researched on it in depth um i wrote um an article on that topic is how the minorities are treated because i so so if not uh, people uh, from the minority group, if they are not holding the ministry's positions, there are often ad advisors. And that's something that we can, in Bosnia and Herzegovina, can only dream of. But uh, to, to create, um, make a um, digression from, from this comment, um, now I'm wondering after all of this uh, that I've heard and after all of the stories and the interviews that we did, um, we have these new generation of young people, and uh, I had a privilege to met, met a lot of brilliant minds from whole Western Balkan regions, really young people, teenagers. And as Samir has already said, they, they have the intention to leave the country and they don't show the intention to come back. Uh, but then we have this generation of uh, who, who were born in the 90s, I'm part of that generation who still have these hopes uh, that they might come back uh, to the country and use their skills and knowledge um, to, to create our societies better. Uh, but also, uh, as Samir already mentioned, to use all the connections that we created, because I personally believe that human connections that we create uh, through, through our period of education and professional life are the biggest resources that we could ever have. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, our countries don't treat those people with those uh, capacities uh, and resources like that. So for me, just a question, who's the fool here? These young people who want to leave and build, build some other societies better because they're going to get better opportunities there for sure. And they're not going to be treated as someone, oh, you're just now acting smart here. 
you came from abroad and acting smart because we unfortunately have many cases of young people coming back and not being able to reintegrate or us who want to come back and do something better. So we just thank you, know. Azra. Maybe mm -hmm. this is the round, uh, the final round that we, we have no more time, but maybe Samir, you can start and then Nula can add something concluding and then we'll end up. Yeah, I'll try to be brief. I, I will be brief. I will not try to be brief. Um, the thing is currently if for, for a young person, um, speaking now again about uh, mobility, young people and EU credibility, I will also touch upon something that, that um, um, we, we, we also heard from, from Ms. Gashi. Um, if a person, if a young person studying currently in the Western Balkans, let's say University of Sarajevo, if they want to apply to study within the region as an exchange student, they, they simply can't. They will have easier time to go and spend, and I'm not making these things up. These programs actually do exist and students do go at exchange in Beijing, Moscow, I don't know, Ankara, Canada, USA. They cannot go to a study exchange period to, to, to Podgorica. Not to mention Pristina, where, and we should be also talking about Bosnian Kosovo visa regime, not only, of course, uh, Kosovo visa regime to the EU, which is degradable, you know, violating fundamental human rights of, of freedom of movement, et cetera, and, uh, you know, degrading uh, EU's credibility. Um, but we should be also talking about intra-Western Balkan mobility. And what I have been, together with some colleagues, arguing for some years now is to establish a uh, intra Western Balkans, Erasmus Plus for the Western Balkans, mm -hmm. you know, because those young people who study in the region, you know, where they meet, they meet on a neutral ground. They go to on Erasmus in Spain and they meet in Toledo, you know, and then you will usually hear the loudest group of Erasmus people are people from the Balkans, at least those who speak Slavic languages, you know, um, and which language do they speak? There, they don't speak Bosnian, Croatian, Serbian, Montenegrin. They speak Nash language, Nash Yazik, our language, you know? So, so, and this is a paradox, you know? We should create um, such spaces for our young people, for students in the region. And this is not just about studying abroad. It's about, again, values. It's about reconciliation. It's about, you know, sharing, sharing common values and building um, our countries and building the futures of our countries, because those young people who study today, who work on the ground today, are the future pillars of our societies, and we should we should treat them um, as 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 such. Speaking just briefly about you know EU's credibility, well, EU's credibility is 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 in is in shambles, you know, um, not because of of one particular country, and it's not from the last year, you know, um, when they when when the EU every time the EU says you know. We demand something from you, so you should deliver. And when you deliver, we will deliver. You know, Kosovo delivered long time ago. They're they're set, oh, fulfilling all the benchmarks for visa liberalization, and the EU didn't deliver. North Macedonia changed the constitution, changed the name of the country. The EU wasn't the one who delivered. So if I see at the corrupt Bosnian officials, you know, when they are asked to deliver by the EU, they can simply say, "Why the heck should I deliver?" If I see what happened with Kosovars and with North, North Macedonians, you know, and they don't want to deliver, not because of Kosovo and North Macedonia, but because their own, you know, uh, background and their their own um, 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 agendas. So in that sense, I think uh, in order to 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 um, help, you know, ourselves, and in order for the EU assist us in a really meaningful way, you know, the EU should take care of of how do they treat the, 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 the region, besides everything that we are doing there on the ground in order to help the region move forward. And by, you know, imposing a visa regime on Kosovo, this is actually imposing and punishing the allies of the EU. And those are those people who are internationally active, who are traveling and who are actually advocates for Kosovo in the EU, for Kosovo in the NATO, you know, for this um, universal values and this, you know, um, um, security and all kinds of other um, systems that we want to uh, be part of. And in that sense, I would say, you know, uh, working together on the ground is, is a prerequisite for us uh, moving, moving forward. Duplicity, you know, those games that it plays with the region. Yeah, Western Balkan, uh, Southeast Europe is not my area of expertise. So uh, I will, I have reflections, of course, but I would not get into it. But um, I think the elephant in the room is citizenship for me. Is that? 
post-World War II Western economies, which needed labor force and got labor force from, you know, Spain, Italy, former Yugoslavian countries, Turkey and Morocco and Spain, Portugal as well. So mainly Mediterranean, Southeast Europe and um, Eastern Europe. What we see in the historical development is that while some of these groups gain rights, such as, you know, after the uh, EU enlargement, the Spanish, the Portuguese, the Italians and the Greeks, they gain their rights. So, so all of a sudden from being labor migrant communities, they become citizen residents of Germany, for example. Mm -hmm. And then we look at the other groups. The Moroccans, the Turkish citizens, the, yeah, the Kosovans, Albanians, uh, Bosnians, and it depends on where they came from, former Yugoslavia, then they stayed, they, are, they, they stayed as who they are, and actually compared to the, those who became EU citizens, their status got low. And then this shows us in terms of equality and in, in terms of uh, economic um, prospects as well, when you look at the crime rates and when you look at the situations on housing and when you look at the statistics of educational levels of these different migrant groups, you see that the Turkish, the Moroccans and former Yugoslavian countries are in the bottom. Tur Turkish citizens were in the bottom. And when you look at the um, citizenship regimes, I mean, German government's change of from the Jus Sanguinis uh, to Jus Soli, it's 2000. This is so late to recognize that the children of migrants could be become Germans and dual citizenships weren't allowed. And today we see, we see in uh, research in the Baltic region, many Lithuanians, Estonians and Latvians, highly skilled who have this transcultural capital from abroad, are returning to the Baltic countries and they are developing. And what you've been discussing in terms of Southeast Europe now, this is not happening. Why? Because of the lack of EU uh, membership. So if you're still talking about this European continent or the EU as this fortress Europe, and it's decided who belongs and who doesn't, these are very, very political situations, especially in terms of the region that we are talking about today, but also in the case of Turkey. And the sufferers of these regimes, which are really inhumane, are again individuals. I'm a highly skilled migrant. I've been abroad for 10 years. I changed seven different EU countries in my life. And each time I have to go through uh, residence permit, you know, it, these processes are really, you know, undignifying in so many ways. And my residence permits are usually given until the very last day of my contract, not even an extra week. And when you live like this, as a highly skilled migrant who has support mechanism, and it affects my psychology so much, imagine the people who don't have the support mechanism, the education and the cultural and social and economic capital who go through these. So we need to put a human face to migration and diaspora, but I think the EU also needs to put a human face and first look at the mirror before uh, patronizing the other countries in the continent. Yeah, I keep on forgetting the microphone. Um, any comments for the end? I, I, um, just a few words. Um, we are talking about um, sharing experiences and uh, sharing practices. And uh, um, I'm sorry, I cannot change the, the um, visa regime and not EU policy. Um, so, but. I think what we can all do is is raising the voices and um, sharing our experiences. And uh, I think um, what you've done during this week and uh, during your research, um, really, really share it with uh, with administration, with uh, politicians, 
um, and make them here to um, really take it in um, the professional work we are doing uh, from day to day and uh, in shaping programs and in, in shaping legislations. And it might seem that um, you are not heard from the beginning and that it takes a long uh, time, but um, just do it anyway, because I think it's it's really, really necessary and um, to um, really learn from what you experienced, what you researched and um, keep on going. Thank you. Lisa, final remarks, concluding? Uh, thank you so much, Ramin. I think uh, going back to Azra's point, I would just want to point out that hope is not a plan. And so as long as migrant community understand that hope is not a plan and they have to organize, uh, that's where we need to, to move forward. Um, um, but in, in, this, in this aspect, I also think we have to be very cautious on, on, on that black and white approaches. Uh, often um, my criticism towards the counterparts, particularly uh, developing partners, is that you should not be seen Western Balkan as a, sort of on a, on a different level in terms of sitting in the table. You shouldn't be coming uh, with your pilot program without having our voices in. In fact, you shouldn't be doing a pilot program without co-creating because a pilot without the other partner uh, being inside the project from day one or beginning to create the idea, then it's, it's, it's no longer an equal because we talk about fair ethical migration, we talk about fair ethical reintegration, but from whose perspective? Who is, who is talking about it, right? So like a particularly from, from a German counterparts, uh, for me, it's very important uh, that the pilots of the project that gets implemented, uh, be it in Kosovo, in Vietnam, or in Ecuador and others, uh, where, where there are like partnership for skills uh, and a partnership for labor, they are not a one side fit all strategy because uh, what you get to recruit in Vietnam uh, with a 92 million uh, population, is not the same as what you get to recruit in Kosovo with 1.7 million population. So I think in that aspect, it's just being cautious and mindful on, on that end and also pushing within uh, within uh, the barriers that are already established right because also it's easy very very easy to to be skipped when you're a critical uh, voice it's easy to be skipped because then the, the next colleague does uh, pick up and then it just moves on and uh, it doesn't reflect and then you are sort of brought uh, at, the, at the last minute inaugural part. So I think here it's really understanding and then understanding the processes, but also from the diaspora community and then particularly for the highly skilled people that uh, are from diaspora or in this case, the Bosnian diaspora, you shouldn't be expecting that the officials who have that one and only job uh, will be will be trying to to engage you always you should be the one that bothers them the most and i i actually from my experience so far here in one year i love the people that are the biggest complainer but i also tell them good you think this could be done you send me the solution let's talk about the solution because it's easy to to complain but when you have a 24-hour day and you have limited capacity it's also not so easy to address uh, all the all the needs. So in this in this aspect, I say um, organize uh, as, as 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 first uh, sort of step. Even if it means bringing ten Boston scholars together to map out their journey, then bring that to an advocacy point, and then from there you got to galvanize other voices. There's so many people that have similar stories, similar trajectories, similar desire to want to come and help and, and, and stay engaged, but they need someone to push. It might The push might not come from the government, uh, but it could be from a civil society. It could be from a private sector, but it could also be from government. If you, within the government, align your um, sort of your partners, you know, if, if you keep on generalizing that everyone is corrupt, everyone is uh, uh, sort of uh, not capable of doing their, their job, uh, it's simple. The reason they, their door is shut is because they're afraid. Uh, you have never tried to truly engage them. And so I think here it's, uh, it, it might need some tactics of, of advocacy, but there is so much need. And maybe in 20 years time, they might come and, and, and beg you to, to return and to stay connected because they come they will come to realize that okay their their terms are over and certainly uh, this winter should be a wake-up call for all Balkan countries with energy crisis at their door uh, because the policies that we could implement 20 years ago 
cannot be implemented within 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 uh, the framework of five months. So uh, there is also ways people say in Europe, you know, blackouts are going to be a wake up call for European politician. I say, well, be careful because you could also get used to blackouts, just like we did in the Balkans, particularly in Kosovo. So it's not always a one solution fit all. That's what I was trying to say. Thank you so much for having me as part Thank of your. Thank you very much for the comments. Thank you. Thank- you all the panelists really this was so fruitful i mean what corinne said this is the only solution dialogue we need to talk to each other there's no other way mm-hmm. and sudost europa gesellschaft gave us this platform a whole week so great you know opportunity this is really rare we have such length of time you know to be able to engage so on behalf of this uh, the Zudo Europa Gesellschaft thank you very much for joining this final discussion and thank you to the society for allowing us to have this whole week uh, and to the uh, uh, the academy here that enabled it in this beautiful setting we wish we had more free time to walk around the lake but uh, next time so thanks again to the audience to the participants uh,